Hey, Fantastic Fest and Fangoria friends and fans. Guess what? Uh, you have just finished Black Box. And if you haven't just finished Black Box, I just want to let you, know, let you know right now, there may be a few spoilers, but I am very, very honored to be sitting here with Emmanuel Osei Kufer, our amazing director for this film. Uh, we're going to ask him a ton of questions because I know your guys' minds are racing. Um, first of all, Emmanuel, congratulations, man. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You made it possible, Jay. You made it possible. Thanks for fighting for me. Um, yeah, yeah. It, it was an honor to do this. It was a humbling experience. And thanks, Fantastic Fest and Fangoria for allowing us to do this Q&A. Yeah. So listen, I, I, my questions are kind of, I have like, they're kind of in like four different buckets. So we'll start with the first. Um, and, and that kind of lies around prep and thinking about this film, right? And so, you know, obviously there was an existing script when you read it, and I just wanna know what attracted you to this project? What attracted you to the, to the characters, to the story? Um, what made you go, oh, I know this, and I have a very strong point of view on this? Yeah, yeah, so I, I come from a coming of age drama background. So every, all the short films that I've done to this point have been about kids um, dealing with adult situations. Um, Blumhouse saw the last short that I did, which is a film called Born With It, which is about a half black, half Japanese boy. And I had a, a general with one of the execs at Blumhouse. And she thought that I would, you know, my sensibility would lend itself well to Black Box. And so she sent it to me and I made the mistake of reading it at 11 p.m. at night. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I read about the backwards man. I heard, I heard the cracking you know, in my head as I was reading. Um, and it was a page turner and I was just really drawn to, you know, Stephen Herman's early draft, you know, and, you know, just Nolan's devotion to his daughter, um, the whole concept of the black box. It was, it was a little mind blowing, you know, and on top of all that, I felt like I was thinking about what I can add to this. Cause I always like to find like a personal um, end to a story. Mm -hmm. And as I just started like, just processing what I could do to, to further elevate the story, I thought of maybe the story can be about a man, a deeply flawed father that's getting the second chance to be a better one, you know, as a result or for the sake of his child. Yeah. Um, it's something that personally with friends and family and loved ones, I have seen, you know, people transform as a result of having a child. Um, there's something magical and transformative about about having somebody that looks like you, that pushes you to be the best version of yourself. And um, that was the heart of the story for me. Um, this, just this indestructible bond between a parent and a child, not only between Nolan and Ava, but also between, this is a spoiler, but between Dr. Brooks and Thomas as well. Okay, so let's talk about, you know, you've obviously done the writing process, right? You've you've really dug into these characters and really drawn out a lot of complexities in their journeys. And that's obviously Nolan has his journey, Ava has hers, Gary has a journey, uh, Thomas and obviously Dr. Brooks. How do you think about telling the story visually? What were, what were some of your inspirations uh, in some of the films that you watched? And then what was kind of Emmanuel's signature, if you will, in telling the story? Mm -hmm. So for me, the, there was, you know, even when I pitched you originally, uh, when I was trying to pitch my visual take on the story, I've always thought of, for whatever reason, when I read the first draft and how I would re rewrite the story, I always felt like this was a mix between Black Swan and The Pursuit of Happiness, conceptually, you know? So Black Swan in the sense that this is a story about, you know, somebody, you know, who is constantly questioning their identity and their sense of reality. And that film, you know, you know, captured that psychology in a really grounded slice of life way. Um, and the pursuit of happiness mainly because of this magical, almost heavenly bond between Will Smith and Jaden Smith that's, you know, perfectly um, captured in that film. And I, and I felt like our film kind of stood somewhere in between those, those two worlds. But on top of Black Swan and the pursuit of happiness, I would also say Unbreakable. Um, you know, that's, that's been an, a very um, influential film in my journey as a filmmaker in general. It's, it's part of the reason why, why I chose to attend Tisch School of the Arts, um, NYU's Tisch School of the Arts. Um, I think M. Night Shyamalan does a really great job of balancing 
um, that film felt like it was a family drama first and a thriller second, you know? So I remember watching it when I was a kid and just feeling like, man, like the performances were so subdued. It was so quiet, yet it was so, so tense, you know? Um, and so chilling, you know? And at the very end of that film, you just, you just felt a lot, you know? And I, it's something that I had always um, hoped to achieve as a filmmaker myself. And, you know, a lot of the quiet moments, you, you talk about my signature, you know, um, the lingering quiet moments is, those are things that directly come from um, Unbreakable and how, how much that, that has affected my sensibility and style as a director. I, I think by subduing performances and leaning into silence, um, every word, every action, um, it just it just has a weight to it, you know. All right, one thing that we have to talk about when you talk about that silence is the cracking of the backwards man's bones because it is, uh, it's deafening uh, and freaky and you literally look over your shoulder and you're like, what is going on uh, every time you hear it? Um, can you just talk about, first of all, who is the backwards man? How did you find the backwards man? Yeah. Uh, how do you direct that movement? Um, you know, I, I personally know that there was a lot of conversation of CG versus practical, but like, can you just talk about a, uh, finding that actor, um, how you directed kind of that movement, um, what that sound and movement meant, and then um, also uh, what the backwards man means, you know, to Nolan and to our story. Yeah, so as far as what it means to the story, um, backwards man is, at least we think he is at the very beginning, Nolan's trauma um, and, and embody, yeah, a personification of his trauma. Um, and so for half the movie, we feel like this, this backwards man, like this backwards man, like figure is doing his best to push Nolan out of every single memory um, and keep him from confronting this deep, dark secret he has. But what we learn later that it is that it is in fact um, Nolan himself um, trying to get back to, to Ava and control his body again. Um, the reason he looks the way he looks in, in these memories is because all these memories are Thomas's memories. And so, you know, there, there cannot be two Nolans, two physical manifestations of Nolans in this world. And so one of them um, who we think is, you know, Nolan's trauma, you know, is rendered in a, in a very crippled backwards, um, freaky manner because he's not supposed to be in this world. Um, as far as how we found Troy or the backwards man, the actor that played the backwards man, we, you know, Lisa Bruce, who's one of our, our great EPs, um, she found him on this show called America's Got Talent. And I remember when she sent an email to all of us, because I, from the get-go, I wanted to do this as practically as possible, right? You know, you go, going back to this unbreakable reference, part of the power of that film and even Japanese films like um, The Ring and Cure um, is, is the fact that most of it is practical. That's where you know, I think I didn't want to rely on CG. Um, so if at all possible, I wanted to find somebody to actually do a lot of the, the movements that were depicted in the script. And when I saw that, the, the video of Troy James and America's Got Talent, I was like, oh my God, like this is the dude, this is, this is the dude. And, and we got really lucky because he was the same height as Mama do, the same skin tone. And, and uh, yeah, all the reactions that you see from no, the, the actor that plays Nolan, Mama do, they're all real reactions because <laughs> he did not want to see uh, Troy do his thing until the actual take. And so, yeah, there were, I remember the first time we saw, you know, Nolan sees the backwards man approaching him, which was a shot of backwards man coming down the aisle in the church. That was the very first shot of Nolan and the backwards man. It was hard to go to the next, the next take because Nolan was just so disturbed. In fact, everybody, everybody. In, that, in that church was disturbed. <laughs> yeah, everybody was. You know, yeah. Um, before we, uh, you know, move on, I, in, in talking about the backwards man and in talking about Nolan, can you just talk about the fight for the subconscious and, and how that plays out in the space? Um, in, you know, obviously there's a point where we shift from uh, Nolan's um, safe room uh, and now all of a sudden we're in Thomas's safe room and in his subconscious. So can you just talk about like 
that fight, that final fight that they have. And like, uh -huh. you know, what was that? Why? Um, and, and how do you, again, how do you uh, take it from here to page to screen? Yeah, so kind of, you know, kind of going back to, you know, all the characters' journeys in the film. So Nolan, even though from the very beginning of the film, this is Thomas's film, you know, Thomas is in the body, just doesn't quite know who he is. Um, Nolan is always trying to get back, get back to, um, try, he's trying to get control of his body again. And so, you know, every time you see Backwards Man, um, who is actually the real Nolan, he's weaker and weaker because Thomas is stronger and stronger. And so by the time he gets to this, this, uh, this final fight, he is done, you know, he is just at the weakest, you know, um, but it's his last, last attempt to take back his body. So he, he has to, you know, take a stand. One of the amazing many of the one of the many amazing performances rather uh in this film is obviously uh, amanda who plays ava mm -hmm. you just talk about the process of finding her um directing children is at, on one hand easy and on one hand tough and again i got to be on set and watch her work and handle it like she had been on set for 30 years but can yeah. you just talk about finding her uh and what yeah you her yeah 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 so Amanda Christine, um, she's incredible. You know, she she steals every scene. In in many ways, she kind of kept Miss Rashad and Mamadou on their toes at every single waking moment. You know, she was always on the like a consummate professional. Um, it was it was insane. I've never met a child actor that 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 confident and that 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 authentic and that truthful all the time, you know? And I remember we, we were looking for a kid that was precocious, that looked like she could, she could be the mother of the house, you know? And, you know, we, we don't doubt that, you know? And so we must have seen, uh, me, me and the rest of the producers, we saw about 20, 30 kids. Um, John McLarry, our, our great casting director, we had, we had great choices, but when Amanda Christine walked into that room, um, I think the, the scene that I had her do was the moment when Thomas explodes on her. You know, the moment where she's like, oh, um, let's go to the store. I think, you know, we need some bean sprouts. And she starts constantly questioning why she needs to go to Gary's house. And just her reaction to that moment, you know, and the realization that this man is not her father and that there's something deeply wrong with her father, it brought us all to tears in the room, to be honest. Um, and we just, I, I, I turned to the producer, Lisa Bruce and, and Aaron Bergman at the time. And I was like, that's her. Like, I don't need to see anybody else, that's her. And, you know, they, they tell you that it's not just, when you're casting child actors, it's not just the child, you're casting the, the, the mother and the child or the parent and the child. And her mother was incredible, you know, her mother was, super supportive of the film, um, you know, she, she, was, she was great. Like when I, when I did rehearsals with the two of them and I remember we didn't have official rehearsals for this film. We, we had an opportunity to just have conversations about the story um, and prep. So I had maybe like three conversations with, um, with Amanda and her mom and we went through every single pivotal scene and we spoke, I spoke to her like, like she was Mamadou, to be honest. And, I was like, this is the emotional event of the scene. This is a subtext, you know? And if she couldn't find a way to connect, I gave her homework, you know, to go home and, you know, find something in her life that she could connect to this moment that would allow it to come alive, you know? And so, yeah, she was incredible, incredible. And I think she's gonna have a, a fantastic career after this film. Yeah, I remember watching that tape and I remember it was like probably 10 o'clock at night. I was sitting on my couch and I remember watching that tape and I think I immediately text on our text chain. I think I immediately text and I was like, this girl is amazing. Like we got to find a way to get her ASAP before she gets busy doing something else and, and we're not able to get her for this film. She was really amazing. Um, yeah, yeah. In talking about Ava, can you just talk a little bit about her journey? And, you know, obviously when we meet her, she's 12 going on 25. Uh, or 10 going on 35 rather, you know, can you just talk a little bit about Ava's journey and, you know, A, how she's, A, you know, keeping the house together, 
um, while balancing being a child. And then also when you get towards the back end of the film and a moment that you brought up um, is uh, when she has to go to Gary's and she knows something isn't right. Can you just talk about like her journey a little bit and what gets her to that point of realizing that something's not right about her dad, how, how she realizes that it's not about her dad uh, no longer having his memory, which she thinks he's going to get back one day, but she goes from that space to like, oh, something's truly not right about this man, about my father, rather. Can you just kind of talk about that journey a little bit? Yeah, like, I don't think she ever knows that somebody else is in the body, you know? She she never comes to that conclusion, but she's, you know, she knows her father, you know? She, she and she knows his every tick, his every mannerism, um, you know, and I, I think her, her father, you know, like it's, you don't see it in the film, but one of the things that I wanted to to really lean into with Ava's character was the idea that she is, she's, she admired her father deeply, you know, in many ways she wanted to be just like her father, you know? And so I think the reason she does what she does is, is she needs him back. She needs him to become who he was again, to help her, you know, become the child or the, the the daughter that she always felt that she she should be, you know? Um, yeah, and yeah, for me, that was that was her journey. That's the reason she was she was so so focused on yeah, I'm so focused on 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 helping Nolan recover, you know. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if I'm answering that. No, I think that's, yeah, 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 think that's yeah. perfect. I think that's exactly what I think, you know, again, I'm, I'm a little bit more clued in, so I know, but I think uh, to me, it's dead on. And I think you definitely see that um, in, in her journey, for sure, 100%. You know, she's doing what she can to keep her family together. I think that's one of the things that I loved about this is like each of these characters in their own complex way is doing whatever they can to keep their family together, right? Or to get mm -hmm. some version of keeping their family together. Um, and so I, I definitely think that answers the question. And also, I also do think that like she, she also has, she just lost her mother, you know? She just lost her mother um, six months prior to that, you know? And so I think she's, she's desperate to win her father back, not just because he's, he's her role model, but because she just can't, she can't go through, um, another loss, you know, and I think, you know, especially in that final scene when, when it looks like Nolan is, is truly gone in that lab, you know, I, I think that's, you, she's, she's replaying the moment when her mother died and the moment, um, yeah, the moment she found out, you know, she can't go through that again, you know, so. You just took me to an amazing place, uh, which is Dr. Brooks's lab. Uh, Lillian Brooks played by the national treasure that is Miss uh, Felicia Rashad. Again, how did you get her? Where, where did she, how did she pop in your mind as like, this is Dr. Brooks? And then can you just talk about, you know, again, some of your first conversations with her, you know, what made you reach out to her um, and just kind of what that experience was like? Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah. So as far as Miss Rashad goes and Lillian Brooks specifically, so Lillian Brooks, when, when I wrote her, um, she was like this even in the original script, but you know, in the original script, she was younger. In my script, she's, she's you know, Thomas's mother. So she's a little bit older. Um, I always wanted somebody that, you know, it was almost like the Brene Brown of neuropsychiatry, you know? Um, I wanted somebody that, you know, was dignified, calm, trustworthy, you know, somebody you would tell your, your closest secrets to. And in my head, you know, there are only a few, it had to be a black actress for reasons that you find out in the film because she's Thomas's mother. Um, but, you know, there are a few, only a few actresses that I knew that can play it. And Miss Rashad was at the top of that list, but this is my first feature. This is my first feature ever. Um, I didn't think that she would say yes, you know? And I, I literally didn't. And it took a certain person that's sitting across from me to push me. His name is Jay Ellis. I don't know if you heard of him, but you know, Jay Ellis, you know, really encouraged me to write, write her a letter and, you know, put my heart on the page and just, you know, really do my best to convince her that, you know, she's the only person that could play this role. Um, and luckily I, I had had the opportunity to meet her a year prior to, to me getting this project. Um, I met her at this, uh, this 
television festival called Austin Television Festival in, in, um, in Austin, Texas. And she was doing this retrospective with Susan, um, Susan um, Kalechi Watson. And she kept talking about her love for Houston. I'm from Houston. And so I just asked a, you know, a fanboy question about her desire to do, do films with Houston, Houston born filmmakers, you know, and little did I know that, you know, a year later, I'd actually get a chance to, to actually ask her to, to be in this film. Um, as far as like her as a person, I, I remember, you know, over preparing for every meeting that I had with her. Um, just thinking that, you know, I had to say the right thing all the time or she'd be gone, you know, but like when I met her, she was, you know, from the get go, the most humble, the most funny, goofy, very, very warm, kind, super collaborative, um, you know, A-list actor that I've ever met, you know. Um, she was like super supportive of my vision and almost, you know, at times went to bat uh, to protect my vision, you know. Mm -hmm. um, we had a lot of conversations about, similar to the conversations I had with Amanda um, and even with Mamadou, we had conversations about key moments and, you know, what her spine was, you know, so you know, Lillian's spine in this film is to get a ch second chance to be a better, you know, to be a better mother um, to Thomas and, you know, give, you know, a allow her son to be the person that he was always supposed to be. Um, but at its core, I think she just really, really wanted to believe that her son was a good person and had, and, you know, he wa she wanted him to fulfill the potential that she always envisioned him um, having. You know, she takes it a little to the extreme, but you know, that's, 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 that's her spine in the film. And we kind of came to that conclusion together. And I, and I just think that she really, she really brought her character to life and in a way that, you know, I could have never predicted. And she gives the role of Lillian Brooks, like a vulnerability mm -hmm. and a desperation that doesn't make her a mad scientist, but you know, pure, she, she comes across as just a desperate mother. And that was one of the goals that I had in this film was not to, I didn't want any, any character to just feel um, evil, right. you know, or just two dimensional. Everybody, everybody thinks they're doing what's right for themselves, you know, so. Was Dr. Brooks waiting this whole time for Thomas to wake up? Did she think that she was gonna have to do this or did she think that Thomas was gonna come to her? Did Nolan just perfectly landed, uh, did Nolan rather just perfectly land in her lap? Like, can you just talk a little bit about that whole, you know, how she got to Nolan and, you know, when she realizes even that Thomas is in there and what, what makes her realize it and that he's starting to wake up? Yeah, yeah. So for, for me, the moment when she realizes, so the backstory, um, in the film is that, you know, she, her, her son died two years ago. She, um, she saves his data on, you know, through an EEG net, you know, so she's able to, she has a file, literally has a file of her, of her son. And she just needed somebody that was brain dead in order to implant um, her, her son's consciousness into. Um, so she implants it in, into Nolan, but, you know, Nolan, for whatever reason, it's an experimental treatment. And so, it doesn't take over the way she thought it was going to take over. And she can't tell him who he is or else, you know, the body could potentially reject, reject the transfer. Um, but for me, you know, I think she remembers or she realizes that, that Thomas is actually in front, inside the body during that hip, initial hypnosis sequence. You know, she, you know, and she, she also starts to realize that Thomas is waking up um, when he remembers the sushi restaurant that they always used to go to. Um, and I think that's, that's what kind of gives her hope. And this is a little bit of a, a uh, what's, what's, that, what's that word, um, uh, an Easter egg um, in the film. That the name of the sushi restaurant in, in Japanese is Nisei, which means fake, you know, but that was just a little Easter egg that I threw in there, but. I love that. I don't think that I actually ever knew that. <laughs> that's actually, that's amazing. It means, it, mean, it means fake person. I love it. I love yeah, it. Yeah. Um, since we're talking about Dr. Brooks, uh, I got to jump to that last moment when we see her. She's been fired uh, and kind of obviously shamed and who know, you know, maybe charges are being pressed against her. But we see her at home in front of her computer with a black box in front of her. What's she doing? And and what do you think her plan is? Or what do you want people to think her plan is rather? Well, I actually want that to be left 
open to interpretation, you know? Um, but, you know, she's, to me, she's simply, she spent the last few months after, you know, being let go um, from the hospital and uh, having her medical license revoked. She's, she's, been, she's been trying to revive her, her software. And so I, I, I think that, you know, at the end of the day, she really wants to find another subject maybe, you know? Um, and I think, you know, the very, the very final scene of the film is it's, it's the first time she realizes that her black box works and that her son's consciousness is, is active, you know? So. And my last question, just cause I know we're running out of time. What do you want people to walk away with after they watch this film? What do you want people to think about? What do you want people to, you know, question themselves? How do you want people to feel? Yeah, so for me, I think on multiple levels, the story is about, you know, just how far a parent will go, just how much a parent will sacrifice for the well-being of their child, you know. Um, Nolan has stayed alive, you know, against all odds. He, he literally should have been brain dead. He should have been gone. But it's, it's, it's his love for Ava that keeps him alive. Um, you know, Thomas, you know, he the final decision that he makes in this film is one for his, his family, for his daughter. Um, you know, the first good decision he makes as a father. Um, and Lillian, you know, you know, sacrificing her career, um, her, yeah, her sacrificing everything, sacrificing a person um, to, to get her son back. You know, it's, it's, it's at the end of the day, this, this story is really about just how much a parent will sacrifice for their child. Well, Emmanuel, you know, I'm biased, obviously, but I think <laughs> you made an absolutely amazing film, man. And thank you again. Congratulations. There's so much there. It's so complex. It's fun. It's frightening. Uh, it's it's everything you want it to be. And you pulled out amazing performances from every single one of our actors. Um, and so kudos to you for that. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. First film. Thank you. No, thanks for thanks for giving me a shot. Yeah. Thanks for giving me this shot now. All right, um, Fantastic Fest and Fangoria friends, that's it from us, that's Black Box. Uh, if you've seen it, you've learned a lot more about the film. If you haven't seen it, you probably got some spoilers, but uh, now you know what you're watching. Take care. Thank you, thank you, thank you.